We can join me in opening your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And if you're using one of the Bibles that's under the chairs nearby, uh, you can find that on page 944. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful for your kindness to us this morning and in our gathering to this point. And so we continue to have eager expectation that you would be miraculously, powerfully at work to shape our thinking, to form our loves, to reshape our lives. So open the eyes of our heart to behold your glory in Jesus and give us a freeing confidence in your commitment to us in Christ. Amen. Well, one of the um, unhealthiest aspects of our culture right now is this atmosphere of criticism. Do you sense that? If you step out of line, you are condemned. The social media mob piles on quickly. You need to suffer economically, socially, personally. There's no forgiveness, there's no grace, there's no redemption. And no matter what side of any particular issue that you're on, this is affecting you. An atmosphere of constant criticism dehumanizes everyone involved. Those who are quick to condemn and cancel, those who are being condemned and canceled, and then everyone else who's around this atmosphere. It's like there's a, an invisible pollution that we're all just breathing in and it's making us sick. It's partly from, and then it exacerbates other problems we have, like our epidemic of loneliness and depression and anxiety. And this isn't just an issue out there. It's, you know, for especially the, the few poor souls who are having everyone pile on them. This is affecting all of us. Some of you have lived in this kind of toxic environment just in your own home and your home life. Or maybe you are anxious when you think of work, let alone go to work, because of a coworker who's just creating this environment of criticism and non-acceptance and rejection. Or maybe you have a client who's set against you and is maybe even pursuing legal action against you unjustly, unfairly, and you don't know what's going to happen. Or maybe someone has been bullying you at school, and there's a certain class that you just hate going to because of what happens there. Or maybe you live in your own head with this constant attitude of criticism toward others, or perhaps self-condemnation constantly. But what if you could live in the midst of this atmosphere and be immune to its effects? What if you could be immune to the pollution? What if you could have an unshakable, liberating, joyful confidence, even when everyone seems set against you? Well, Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 34, is here to show us that this is possible. And it comes from understanding and embracing, internalizing, and applying four words to your life. For all who are in Christ by faith, here are the four words. God is for you. Those four words, easy to say, incredibly hard to actually believe in a way that penetrates your soul, changes how you feel and think. We can believe them at a surface level, but the more we believe, the more deeply we believe, the more this gets internalized, the more free we'll be from the effects of criticism around us. We'll not only no longer be sucked into an atmosphere of criticism, but we will start to spread a new kind of atmosphere around us. One that says, if God is for me and God is for you, then I'm for you. And I want you to know it and I want you to feel it. And then churches are created. And we're, we're living in the midst of one. God has given us this and we just want more. 
where there's an atmosphere of God's acceptance that gives us a liberating joy where we then can communicate to other people. If God is for you, then I am for you. Do you know people like that in your life? They are for you. Which means even when they have a a legitimate criticism or constructive feedback for you in your life, you're actually not only non-anxious about it, but you welcome it because this person is so in your corner. You know the difference I'm talking about, don't you? Certain people bring up a criticism and your heart rate goes up. Other people, you're like, I I welcome it from you. You love me. I love you. So Romans 8, verses 31 to 34. Let's read it together. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. And then we'll see the rest next week. (laughs) So here's the message of this text for all who are united to Jesus by faith. Because God is for you, nothing needs to touch your deepest joy and confidence. Because God is for you, you can have a liberating confidence in life even if everyone's against you. No opposition against you can ultimately succeed. No accusation against you can ultimately stick. No condemnation against you will ultimately stand. So here's what we see in this text. Paul summarizes the blessings of the gospel with this phrase, God is for us. And then he applies the gospel to some specific aspects of our lived experience. He shows how this gives us confidence in the midst of condemnation. So let's just walk through those two categories here. First, this summarizing of the heart of the gospel. Verse 31, it's a transitional moment in the chapter. Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? So he's saying, I've been unfolding these wondrous realities of the gospel up to this point. Now, what do we say to this? What difference should this make? How do we respond to this? So, what are the these things that we are now about to respond to? What, what are the these things he's referring to? Well, this probably refers to what he's been unfolding for several chapters. Certainly, all of chapter 8 is in view up to this point. And then he just summarizes all of this with one phrase. He brings everything together with these four words, God is for us. Do you see that? He says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So he's summarizing all of chapter 8 with that phrase, God is for us. He's saying, in light of all of these things I've said before, which we can sum up just by saying, God is for us, what then? What difference does this make now? If this is true, here's how we should respond. So, this shows us that the gospel message at the heart of Christianity is both profound and simple. It's profound because this is what we've been considering for the past few months. Week after week, we've been looking at this infinite wonder of the gospel. And yet, it's also simple. It could be summed up with this phrase, God is for you. That's Paul's summary of our series in Romans 8 so far. God is for us. So, what is he summarizing with this phrase, God is for you? What have we seen? Well, here are the profound realities in Romans 8 that we've seen so far. So, Romans 8 is kind of like the diamond of the gospel, and we turn it and we see light refracted 
in different ways. So, here's the facets of the diamond of God's grace we've seen. So, you can just look at the beginning of chapter 8. I'm just going to walk through a few sections here from what we've seen. We've seen the liberating verdict of justification in verse 1. So, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because Jesus died in your place and He rose again. You are now in the sphere of Jesus. You're united to Him permanently, irrevocably, by faith. He's risen and justified, and therefore you share in that verdict of righteous. We've seen the deepest cure of sin in verses 2 to 4, so we're not just free from the penalty of sin. We're free from its power. Obedience used to be impossible But when you are in Christ by faith, it's now inevitable. We've seen the new mindset in verses 5 through 11. God takes us out of the realm of self-centered flesh, and He plugs us into this new life of the Spirit. We have a new mindset. We have this urgent task then of killing sin in verses 12 to 13. So we now must, and we can, and we will kill sin and love our Savior. We've seen the highest privilege of the gospel as adoption in verses 14 to 17. We are adopted into God's family, and we become His loved children with an eternal inheritance. We've seen the eager anticipation of renewal in verses 18 to 22. So, the creation itself is longing for and eagerly anticipating the renewal of all things. The creation will not just be crumpled up and thrown into a cosmic trash can. It will be renewed for us to enjoy forever. Then we see the hope of resurrection in verses 23 to 25. Our bodies will fail, but we'll be resurrected like Christ one day. We've seen the comfort of the Spirit's intercession in verses 26 to 27. When we are so distressed, we don't even know what to pray for. The Holy Spirit is interceding with groans too deep for words. We've seen the promise of God's sovereign goodness in verse 28. God works all things together for good for those who are in Christ. And we've seen God's eternal plan of salvation in verses 29 to 30. God planned this unbreakable chain of salvation where we are foreknown, predestined, called, justified, and glorified. And now Paul summarizes all of this with four words. God is for you. How could you doubt that? In light of all of this, He will never condemn you. His Spirit is in you and has set you free from the power of sin. He's given you a new mindset of life. He empowers you to kill sin and love your Savior. He's adopted you into His family. He's given you the inheritance of all things. Creation itself will be renewed, and you'll be given renewed, resurrected bodies to enjoy it forever. And most of all, to enjoy the triune God and His presence forever. And in all the suffering that we have right now, all of it is worked together for good for those who are in Christ. And He's known you before the foundation of the world, and He chose you for this salvation, and He's brought you to Christ. He has called you. He's justified you. And glorification has, in fact, already begun. Could He do anything more to convince us that He is for us? When you become a Christian, you walk into a whole new atmosphere of grace. So, this raises a question. What shall we say to all these things? How do we respond if it's true that God is this for us? Well, that's what we see next. So, second, applying the doctrine of the gospel. Paul applies this reality of God being for us to three issues. These are nagging issues that never seem to go away. They're opposition, accusation, and condemnation. So, this is the atmosphere that we live in, and Paul now is going to apply a different facet of the diamond of the gospel to each one of these. So, I'm going to refer to these facets of the gospel as doctrines, because that's what they are. They're the doctrines of the gospel that we've seen already in Romans 8. And now we're learning, not only can this be summed up with this phrase, God is for us, But then we can take different doctrines of the gospel, different facets of the gospel, and apply them to very specific, concrete issues in our everyday lives and even in the emotional atmosphere that we live in. So, specifically to opposition, accusation, and condemnation. So, here's what we'll see. He applies the doctrine of our hope to opposition, 
the issue of opposition. He applies the doctrine of justification to accusation, and he applies the doctrine of Christ's intercession to condemnation. So you may find the realities of God's grace in the gospel don't seem relevant to your life. Maybe it doesn't affect your emotions or actions during the week. If that's the case, then this is an invitation to begin learning how to apply the truths of the gospel to your thoughts, your emotions, and your life. Because if the gospel is boring to you and you don't see how it applies to your life, you've not yet learned the skill of living in light of it. You've not yet learned the skill of taking the realities of the gospel and connecting them to your thoughts, emotions, and actions. So this is an opportunity to learn how to do this. So Paul gives us a model for that. He's showing us how the gospel is relevant to these three topics, how it changes how we handle opposition, accusation, and condemnation. So here's how he does it. He asks three questions, and the answer to each one of them is obvious in light of the reality that God is for us. So the three questions are, who can be against us? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? And who is to condemn? You see those? And the answer to each one of them isn't stated explicitly because it's obvious. These are rhetorical questions. No one. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. If God is for us, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? No one. If God is for us, who's there to condemn? Nobody. So the answers are obvious. He's asking these questions almost triumphantly. That's the tone. If God is for us, no opposition can stand. No accusation can stick. No condemnation will stand. And then he brings some facet of the diamond of the gospel to bear on each one of them. So let's just walk through each of these more closely. So first, he applies the doctrine of hope to opposition. So here's the question in verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? So he's asking that rhetorically, triumphantly. If God is for us, the point is nobody can be against us. Well, what does he mean? Because you and I know that just because God is for you, that doesn't mean people stop being against you. He doesn't mean here that nobody can actually be set against Christians in no sense at all. In just a few verses, Paul's going to talk about how Christians may face persecution and death. His point is that if God is for us, no opposition will ultimately succeed. It's like if you have a Bugatti, and you're going to be racing against a family van. (laughs) Is it a competition? Technically, yes. It is no competition, though, right? There is no competition because the outcome is sure. So competition in one sense, but not really. People can be against you in one sense. They won't ultimately succeed. His point is, that God is for us, and so no one can be against us, ultimately. Opposition is real. Many of you know what it's like to have someone set against you. You may have a bully who's set against you. Or you've had someone in the past, and even the words they say still can't stop from rattling around your brain. You could have the government set against you. Many governments are set against Christians and hostile hostile to them. It's been that way for 2,000 years. The cancel culture mob, especially on social media, with all their hungry rage, can be set against you. They're blinded by rage, and they come after anyone in an instant. Satan and the unseen demonic world are set against you. You may be set against yourself. Paul draws on one facet of the gospel here to overcome this deep fear of opposition. It's the hope of our inheritance in Christ. See that in verse 32? Here's how he brings the gospel to bear to this question, who can be against us? He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? It's an amazing argument here. Paul says that God did not spare his son, but gave him up for us. And so his argument is, if God is willing to do that, then of course he'll give us all things, because giving us all things is not as hard is giving up his own son for us. He's already given us the greatest gift. Won't he give us the lesser gifts, which is everything? So he's drawing on this promise 
that Christians have an inheritance in Christ, the inheritance of all things. Whatever opposition we face right now will not last. Whatever people can take away from you in their opposition, God will give back to you and more forever. You'll ultimately get Jesus and the new creation to enjoy forever. So, whatever opposition you face, you can stand with a confidence. God is for me. Whatever is going to be taken away from me here, God will give it back. And we already saw in verse 28, even what they do to you is being worked together for your good. Second, he applies the doctrine of justification to accusation. Verse 33, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. So he's not saying that no one can bring any accusations or charges against us. He's saying that no accusation will ultimately stick forever. The issue dealing with, he's dealing with here is this incessant accusation. And it's real. We live in an atmosphere of accusation. Satan accuses us. Roman, or Revelation 12 says that he's the accuser of the brothers. He loves to see sin happen and then lodge an accusation against us. Our conscience accuses us. Our consciences will tell us that we've done something wrong. The conscience is a great gift so that we can know when we've done something wrong and then therefore repent. But if we've then been forgiven, that should silence our conscience on that matter. But the conscience doesn't always listen to that. So it can keep bringing up things over and over until we feel miserable. Other people can accuse us. They know what we've done. They can magnify our weaknesses. They can make us feel worse. Siblings can do this. Spouses can do this. Parents can do this. Coworkers and classmates can do this. And then we just live in this atmosphere of accusation. But Paul draws on the doctrine of justification, this facet of the gospel, to overcome our paralysis from accusation. So he says, who can bring any charge against God's elect? Obviously, answer, no one. Why? It is God who justifies So God has justified his people, which means in God's cosmic courtroom, the accusations have been heard, and God has declared us not guilty in Christ. He's declared us innocent and righteous, not because accusations aren't true, but because Jesus died for us. He took our penalty. Martin Luther understood how to apply the doctrine of justification to this sense of accusation from our conscience uh, better than anyone, it seems. And if you want to just live in this for a while, pick up a copy of his lectures on Galatians uh, from 1535. And there's a couple different versions. That's why I give the date. Um, and he just con- it's really just a celebration of justification on every page of his lectures and commentary. And he also talks about this reality in letters that he wrote to people and encouraged people. So I want to read from an example from a letter. A woman wrote to him who is distressed with this sense of accusation. And she could sense, in this case, that this was coming from Satan. And so Luther wrote to her, spit on the devil. You already knew it was Luther. Just saying that. Spit on the devil and say, but listen to his logic here. Have I sinned? Well, I have sinned. And I'm sorry. But I shall not despair, for Christ has taken away the sins of the whole world, of all who confess their sins. So it is certain that this sin of mine has also been taken away. Be gone, devil, for I am absolved, and at this I am bound to believe. And if I had committed murder or adultery or had even crucified Christ himself, this too would be forgiven if I repented and acknowledged the sin. As Christ said on the cross, Father, forgive them. Some of you have very sensitive consciences, and that's good. People with tender consciences are very aware of their own sin, as the Lord is. And as you grow as a Christian, you realize how deep your sin goes, and that can be a great tool to help you fight it. Repent it, repent of it, and fight it. But you need to also let your awareness of sin lead you to an ever-increasing enjoyment of God's grace. As your perception of your own sinfulness grows, 
you need to also let your perception of God's grace to you grow. As your sin gets bigger, the cross should get bigger. This is why for Christians, the cross should always become a greater marvel than it was the day before. Because you're, you're learning more of just what it was that Jesus did for you. For some of you, you need to ask the question, do you think that you have a sin that was too great for the cross to cover? Do you think you could ever be de-justified? Do you think that He forgives your sin, and so you're safe eternally, but then at the judgment, He's going to embarrass you for that sin? No. He is for you 100% now and forever. Third, he applies the doctrine of Christ's intercession to condemnation. Verse 34, who is to condemn? So Paul says, if God is for you, who's to condemn? No one. And then he applies another facet of the gospel to this. It's the doctrine of Christ's intercession. Look what he says next to support this. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So the reason you won't be condemned is this. Jesus is the judge, and he doesn't condemn you. And Paul's very specific here, not general. He says that Jesus died, he rose, he is seated at God's right hand, and he is interceding for us now. So the intercession of Jesus, not mentioned a lot in the New Testament, and I think that's perhaps one of the reasons why it's widely neglected by us, but it's one of the most comforting realities. How would you answer someone who asks you the question, why should you as a Christian not need to feel condemned anymore? I think most Christians would say, well, because Jesus died for me. That's a true answer. Or you may say, because, because of Jesus' death, I am declared righteous, innocent, forgiven, justified. True answer. But Paul goes beyond this here. He says it's also because Jesus is right now interceding for you. What does that mean? It means that the Lord Jesus Christ is constantly, moment by moment, maintaining our justification. If you have a digital watch and you see the seconds flash, or you have a second hand, tick, 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 every time that's happened in your whole life since you've been justified, Jesus has been interceding, 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 interceding. Every single moment, He's interceding for you. He is always, here's, here's what this means, He is always ensuring that His death counts for you. Even as you still sin here and now, He is committed to making sure that our sin won't damn us. He is constantly maintaining our reconciliation with God on the basis of His death and resurrection. Hebrews 7.25 put it this way, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So Jesus' atoning death purchased our salvation. Jesus' intercession applies it to us moment by moment. The English Puritan pastor Thomas Goodwin wrote a whole book on the verses we're looking at right here. He has a large section on this doctrine of the intercession of Christ. It's incredibly insightful. Here's how he put it. He said that Jesus' death purchased our salvation and His intercession applies it to us. He says, why does God not remember our sins anymore? Because Jesus is reminding Him of His sacrifice for our sins. He wrote, we owe our standing in grace every moment to His sitting in heaven and interceding every moment. So, that book by Thomas Goodwin is called Christ Set Forth. 
was the precursor to his book, The Heart of Christ, which I've mentioned um, over time before. And if you just want to go just one step deeper on this doctrine of intercession of Christ, I know a number of you have read um, Dane Ortland's book, Gentle and Lowly. He has a chapter in there on the intercession of Christ. Um, I reread it this week. It's phenomenal. So just encourage you to do that. If you don't have Gentle and Lowly, encourage you to grab a copy. So this is how Paul applies the gospel to the issues of opposition, accusation, and condemnation. Do you feel opposed? Remember your inheritance in Christ. Do you feel accused? Remember that God justifies you. Do you feel condemned? Remember that Jesus Christ is interceding for you every moment. So how do we respond to all of this? Well, here's four quick implications. First, let's never get tired of studying the gospel at various levels. The gospel is deep enough for theologians to study for eternity. It's also clear enough for a four-year-old to understand. It can be summed up with the wonder we've seen in Romans 8 in this series so far, and it can be crystallized in those four words, God is for you. So let's learn to explore the depths of the gospel and summarize it in four words as well. All theology is essentially gospel theology. Every systematic theology topic you can think of has some relationship to God's grace through Jesus. Every story in the Bible has some natural and organic connection to the grace of God in Christ. Paul says in Colossians 2 that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ Jesus. The wonders of the gospel can't be exhausted. So if we're bored with the gospel, the problem is not the content. Second, let's learn to apply the gospel to all our problems. That's what Paul's doing here. He applies the good news that God is for us to opposition, accusations, and condemnation. So he's taking a facet of the gospel then and refracting its light onto each problem. So do you fear what opposition will take away? He says, consider Christ's inheritance. Do you fear accusations? Consider that God's verdict is the only thing that ultimately matters, and he justifies you. You fear condemnation? Remember Jesus inter interceding for you moment by moment, and we can just go on from here. Do you, are you tempted to despair? Look for some facet of the gospel that applies to this. When you're tempted to lust, find a facet of the gospel that applies to this. Any sin and struggle, there's some facet of the gospel that you can remember and trust in. That's a perfect match. So learn the gospel well and view this task of applying the gospel to your thoughts and emotions in life as a lifelong skill to develop and learn from Paul how to do this. This is constantly what's happening in the New Testament. Third, let's live in the gospel's atmosphere of grace. If you have hope that God will give you all things so that no condemnation or no opposition will succeed. If you have been justified so that no accusation will stick to you. If you know that Jesus is interceding for you so that no condemnation will stand. How, how then can you explain any reasonable uh, reason to be complaining, critical, judgy? spreading an atmosphere around you of condemnation. If God has created this atmosphere of grace for you to enjoy and breathe in, how can you create a toxic environment around yourself, suffocating everyone around you by your criticisms? Instead, let's continue to cultivate a culture of grace and acceptance. Cultivate this in your friendships. Let them know that you are for them because God is for them. In your homes, in your church family, let's communicate to people around us that they matter to us because they matter to God. And we can show the world an alternative to what they're experiencing. And this is especially important in light of our world's polarization over any number of topics like class and ethnicity. I get that there's disagreements on how to think about just how entrenched our nation is in certain sins and racism, whatever you make of those debates, racial prejudice is evil and wrong. It condemns people without ground, and if it's a brother or sister in Christ, you are condemning someone that God has already welcomed. If God celebrates them, why would you condemn them? If Jesus is interceding for them, why would you treat them as lesser? If their fellow heirs with you, don't let their background or culture or skin tone or anything else or social status like this be a cause for judgment. 
Finally, if you're not yet a Christian, you are welcome to breathe in this atmosphere of grace and receive this from the Lord. The reality is that the one who made you is either for you or against you. If he is for you, then no one can ultimately be against you in a way that ultimately matters. But if he is against you, then no one can be for you in a way that ultimately matters. We'll all stand before him. All other supports will be gone. His opinion alone matters. And he offers a full acceptance and welcome with a smile for all who are united to Jesus by faith. So let's receive this by faith. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the freeing, liberating grace that you give us. And we thank you that you have given us as a church family a culture that is reflecting your grace, and we want more. We pray that you would help each one of us to spread this welcome of Christ to others. In Jesus' name, amen.